Okay? Don't worry. It's nonsense. It's just uh, we thought well, let's have a pub. Uh, okay? And we just showed that it could be very extremely complicated, uh, that in fact you don't even observe it, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, the, the growth rates, you know what a counter set is? You understand it more? There's this interesting thing from counter how you partition uh, the unit interval. I have to remember the way it works. Uh, you split it in three pieces, one third, two third, and you take away the middle. Okay, and then each one of these you also split in three pieces and take away the middle. And then you keep doing that. And the intersection of all this set is a counter set, which is uh, nowhere dense in the unit interval, but I think it has a positive, I, I even forgot, this is kind of stuff I forgot. Check it out. I, I, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself. I didn't prepare this. So I didn't go check. Check, check out what the counter set. And what we prove with Kazuo and Makoto is that the set of equilibria of that model, it's a two sector model with very simple externality, has a structure actually of a perturbed counter set. Well, I mean, not a perturbed. This is symmetric. It's a counter set. But this is very symmetric, right? Because you keep cutting. Ours is obtained by cutting off pieces of a function that is not symmetric on the unit interval. It's kind of bent on the right. There's more stuff on the right than on the left. And so you cannot uh, go symmetrical in cutting off the piece. But it's a pure, the point is that the externality role at a certain point, because it has no discipline, became a very strange way of getting mathematical results that made absolutely no sense from the point of view of a person that says, I'm talking about what happens over there in, in, in Mestre or in Milan, okay? Fine, I mean, it's interesting, and when you're young, you, or you know, you know, you can get fascinated by the math, by the theory, by the abstractness, by the uh, amusing implication, but then you have to be careful and say, wait, 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 yeah, that's, that's an mathema applied mathematics exercise, it's, this is nothing to do with stock market the growth rate of Botswana or what's happening in Indonesia. <laughs> Otherwise, you get confused. So if you're curious about circus things, you can go check the paper. Okay, so that's what we do then. That's the technical part of the thing, okay? Question? Okay, so now let's do, for a moment, let's think about externality together. Okay, so that's the technical part of that literature. It didn't go much farther than that. Okay, there's a lot of stuff with externalities, but very frankly, at a certain point, it became a game of strangeness. Right? People realize, we realize, but not only us, that you could put externalities here and there and bend models all kind of ways, okay? I remember, so I have another, I, I, as I said, it also gave me a few papers. I mean, I was trying to make my career, given that, that economics is not exempt from fashions, and when you're young, you don't have all that peace of mind and the tranquility of saying, I don't care about fashion, I'll do what I think is right. You do follow fashion because you want to be with the crowd, you want to be invited to conference, you want to be cited. You're right, you want to go with the flow, you want to get your full professorship, uh -huh. you don't mind being promoted, you just got two offers, you want to get another one, you know, especially in the international environment, being a hot potato gets you the offer, gets you going. So I was no different from other people beating 89, 88, uh, 90 when I stopped doing the chaos thing and did this for a few years, I didn't mind to have my papers published in good journals and have offers. So actually I have a paper in JET, which I think is the paper, first paper that shows that. I take an overlapping generation model and I put accident in the production function and obviously I show that you can get, you know, flying elephants, Banyai making sense, uh, you know, uh, Grillo being entertaining, uh, all kind of uh, things, uh, you know, the lagoon water getting clean, uh, 
you know, with XNI you can prove everything, so that you can get all multiple equilibria of all kinds. Um, Kiminori has written, Kiminori would probably feel offended uh, if he hear me, he's a, he's a nice guy, Matsuyama, he has got a huge sequence of papers on externality in development in which the external effect tends to uh, do the thing that I described before, right? When you have little capital, you stay poor. When you have a lot of capital, you become rich and stay rich. So there's a big literature on that. There is a paper that I mentioned to you the other day, which I will not mention the author, which is the most quoted in that literature, that tries to show that there is a threshold, left of the threshold, you stay poor, right of the threshold, you become rich. Paper is completely wrong. Uh, it proves, in fact, the opposite, that no matter where you start, you can go anywhere. You can start very rich and become immediately poor. You can start very poor and become immediately rich. But they didn't realize. So that literature has produced all, thousands of papers. Very frankly, while 60 plus years later, we are still looking at solo and, and saying, well, there was a point there. We're still looking, say, at Arbor and say there was a point there. You know, if not empirical, at least a theoretical point that I can see how to use, and, and many other examples we can make, right? I frankly don't see a single paper in that literature in which you can say, oh, that's a point that is valid. That's a point I should keep using, you know, for the next few decades. Even forget the empirical part, maybe empirically. It could be changed, but theoretically, it's an insight on the way economies work. I frankly don't see one. Right? Uh, certainly, the genetic external effect is not uh, uh, new. Ah, by the way, before, in explaining what I was trying to say, I, I apologize. I, for, I completely forgot. It crossed my mind for a moment to cite it. The method of taking parametrically the sequence of capital stock that the aggregate people choose. Choosing your own and finding a fixed point. This is an idea due to John Chipman. So that's the technical idea, but John Chipman was a professor of economics in Minnesota and a colleague for a while, uh, and specialized in international trade, mostly the general equilibrium international trade, has a paper, I believe, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics 1970, which you should take a look. And what he does is basically that only in finite time, so finite dimension. He says, let's consider an economy with external effect in production. And firms and agents, right, find a number of periods. But I think he has two periods, today and tomorrow. Okay? I take the action of the other as given. I know there is an external effect on mine. Okay? There are no market prices to mediate the external effect. I choose my action. And then equilibrium is in the sense of Nash. A point at which your action and my action are mutually compatible because my action is the best response to your action and your action is the best response to my action. Okay? In finite dimension, that's all that there is. And it's a straight forward. Uh, fixed point theory. Okay, so the method was that. So it was already there by Chipman. I think Romer's acknowledged that. I think the Chipman paper is cited in his paper, right? And it's just a, a way of generalizing it to infinite device. Other than that, and other than recognizing the general intuition that if you put arbitrary externality in production functions, things become extremely messy and, and, and anything can happen, uh, you don't really get uh, uh, much more. I may be wrong, but that's what I got from that literature. Okay. Now, externalities. I think it's very easy to mention negative externalities. People, you know, collapse Strada Nova and Lista España. People in autobus don't take a shower and they smell horribly. You know, people get stuck at intersection because some idiot wanted to cross and did not when there, there was red light coming and so on. People pollute, people throw plastic around, people smoke in your face, people fart in your face, 
People do all kinds of things to each other. Right? So no doubts that there are negative externalities. In fact, we have even set up a penal system and a punishment system, a law and order system, to in some sense stop them. Because we punish not only voluntary damages, we punish even involuntary damages when it's serious enough and there is enough negligence. Okay? And in some sense, that's a system to limit externalities. Right? Crossing with a red light, even if you don't cause an accident, being punished is a way of deterring negative externalities. And so on. Good. But nobody that crosses with a red light wants to kill you. If they kill you, it's a side effect. <laughs> All they want to do is just to cross you with a red light because they're in a hurry, right? So nobody has any doubt about negative estimate. How about the positive ones? My problem with the positive one is that, or two order, I don't see what they have to do with economic growth. Really, I don't see what they have to do with economic growth in the history of humanity. Two, while I can see positive externalities here and there, I believe they're short-lived and they're often internalized. So an example that people in that literature often brought about is the example of the analogs of district. You know? High-tech people conglomerating in cities, in areas where they can exchange information with each other. And in some sense, and that's a more, it's a deeper observation, this has always happened. Economic growth, most of the times, is a product of cities, of human agglomeration. Yes, there has been economic growth in the countryside, you know. Horseback riding, the, the, the steer out, shovels, you know. Agriculture. I mean, a lot, of a lot of technological improvement has happened outside cities, no doubt. But I would say the driving forces, the driving entities behind every lasting episode of growth was the existence of a city. Right? That maybe created an incentive for the countryside to be more productive, or maybe the people from the city own the countryside and try to improve it. You know, the Jeffro Tolls of the history of the humanity. But certainly it is true that one way of thinking at periods of economic growth is almost always to do with the expansion of some big urban areas. Particularly true in the, say, modern economic growth, the one we have good records, post-1000, you know, the Italian cities and commune, and then the cities of the Northern League and, and the Anseatic League and the Netherlands, and, and so on, right? Uh, in fact, from that point of view, England may be a bit of an exception. There was a lot of stuff going on in London, Manchester, Liverpool, but there was also a lot going on in the countryside of, of, of England uh, during the last generation. So people are trying to say, see, people go to cities because they can talk to each other. That's an externality. I don't tend to think that that's an externality because that stuff is hugely interiorized. Yes, you know, if you become, you go work for a big firm, you get a lot of benefit. Yeah, but big firms typically pay you less and make you work harder. They know they're providing you with benefit. The famous architect knows that if you come out of his studio, you have a much better reputation learning things more than coming out of, you know, Paul Dream studio. And Gets that. If I in the old days, the, and even today, the artisans, the painters, and people working with them, they had to pay for that. So they were quite aware that they were providing positive externality to the point that you want to go to Bottega, that sort of Michelangelo Bonaparte, well, you pay. There was a lineup. Michelangelo had different ways of making you pay, but <laughs> well, you pay. You know, people have different tastes, it's okay, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Point is, yes, that was also a way of internalizing the externality. I'm sorry. That's the way it is. That's the way it is, okay? That's the way it is, right? Uh, I, I, it doesn't matter if it is more or more. You know, the fact is that it is, right? So there is not a lot of positive externalities out there. The moving to district is intentional. And it has nothing to do with extra, it's price in the land. So yes, if I run a, 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 a regressions, 
I will notice that wage, individual wage rates tend to be monotone increasing, controlling for other variables, in the wage rate of the people around that. But why would that be a proof of externality per se and instead not a proof about the people concentrating in certain areas because they can trade and then reduce the transaction cost? Yes, the lawyer in the center of Manhattan is more expensive than the lawyer in St. Louis. The surgeon in the center of Manhattan is more expensive than the uh, surgeon in St. Louis. Anything in the center of Manhattan is more expensive than the, uh, anything else in the center of St. Louis. Which is why? Well, because if I'm a top lawyer, I want to go trade my service for the service of a top surgeon. And I'm a top barbershop, and I'm a top restaurant, and a top musician. Nothing strange that top people tend to self-select and concentrate themselves in certain areas where they can interact with themselves. What's the point of being a fantastic... I mean, they're very... There are rare subjects like Warren Buffett that are not like that. You know, the richest man in the world, the second richest man in the world, lives in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, or so he says, it's most of the time on his private jet somewhere in the world, okay? Fine, but let's pretend that he really lives in Omaha, Nebraska, never goes to the opera, never goes to a nice restaurant, never dresses properly, never lives in a... In a fine, he's clearly an exception. Most people, once they can afford it, and they can afford it because of their output, because of the quality of their output, likes to go consume the good stuff. So there are agglomeration incentives that has to do with the fact that it reduces the transaction cost. Right? If I move to the center of Manhattan, if I move to the center of Paris, if I move to the center of London, that, that minimizes search cost. I know exactly that around me there is only high quality stuff. Whatever is around me that is not high quality stuff will not last long, will disappear by a selection mechanism because the people choosing are good. Right? You can be a bad restaurant out there in the boonies near St. Louis, you can pretend to be a good restaurant and you're a bad restaurant for a long time. I've seen many because people have no taste. But you're not going to survive uh, you know, in the very center of, in, 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 in the Greenwich Village or, 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 or in the center of Milan if you don't cook properly. Because So I don't see the externalities there. It seems to be all internalized. It seems to be Right? And, and also, where is the positive externality kicking in the history of economic growth? See what I mean? Where is it? And let me tell you why I think it's so. Because if I see that I have a positive effect on you, my self-interest will bring me to internalize. Right? I have no incentive to do anything to internalize my negative externality. You pay for it. Why should I make an effort to internalize it? In fact, I have the opposite incentive. Right, I have the opposite incentive, exactly. But if I realize that I'm having a positive externality, and unless we're completely stupid, we typically realize that, then we also have an incentive to create a market, to create a device, to create a request for favors, status, whatever, even a thank you, right? That internalizes the externality. We have an incentive to go look for people that appreciate what we do. Exactly in the same way that when we don't wash. Uh, we don't take shower, we have an incentive to go to places where they cannot complain if we smell bad, right? So it seems to me that the, the search for lasting positive externality that would explain process of economic growth is intuitively the wrong way to go. And historically I don't see why, you know, magically positive externalities appeared in the Italian communes of 300, in Amsterdam in 600, and in UK in 700, that produced innovation, and they were not there in Seville, Spain, in the same time. Seville was a big city, a lot of traders, a lot of uh, cultures. Why the Industrial Revolution didn't start in Seville, that was one of the richest cities of Europe. Uh, and the world in 1600 or 1500 and started in uh, um, Liverpool, Manchester, London, whatever. Right? I, 
I frankly don't see where one externality is there. What changed in Chinese externality in 1980? Right? What changed in Indian externality in 1980? Um, so, I don't know. That's, that's, that's always been my, my doubt. With one exception, I have to say, and it is the one that, in fact, in the work with David, we have studied the models. There is one positive externality that every human has on other humans. And it's almost unavoidable, even if, when we know that we are competing with others, we go out of our way to try to eliminate that externality. And it's the externality called imitation. Humans imitate other humans. You must imitate good practice. Humans tend to imitate successful practices, right? Everywhere. When you are a